Hello guys, welcome back once again to From the Ash. So good to have you here for another Only Fools and Horses related video. As you can see, I am not out and about today. I am at home, sat at my dining room table because we're not looking at Only Fools and Horses locations today. We're looking at Only Fools and Horses Christmas specials. Christmas is on the way. We're gonna be putting the Christmas specials on the TV and we're gonna be enjoying them over the festive period. Now, I thought I would go through the list of all of them because there are 18 of them, believe it or not. So today I'm gonna to go through all 18 and I'm gonna put them in what I think is the order worst to best. We're gonna do that today. This is my order that I'm gonna go through today. If you are new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe as well because there will be a lot of other Only Fools and Horses related content coming soon on this channel. So you're gonna to wanna to be around for that. So do subscribe to the channel. But let's get into it. These are the Only Fools and Horses Christmas specials in order from worst to best, in my opinion. In at number 18, I have got Thicker Than Water, released in 1983, making it one of the first Only Fools and Horses Christmas specials ever made. I've got it bottom on my list. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy the episode. It's still a good Only Fools and Horses episode. However, for me, it didn't quite feel distinct enough or special enough to be considered a Christmas special. It's still very watchable and very funny. However, I don't know. I think the quality of the Christmas specials just got better over time. And so for me, that's why I've got this one in so low. It does also feature Grandad, which is quite nice because not many of the Christmas specials do have him in. The majority of them come after Leonard Pierce passed away, sadly. So a lot of the Christmas specials have Uncle Albert as opposed to Grandad. So it was nice to see him in this one, although don't trust him with a pizza, particularly after this episode. It also features one of the major story arcs of Only Fools and Horses for the first time, which is the question around Rodney's father, who that might be. So it does feel quite a, you know, an important episode, but it's not a favorite of mine, and that is why I've got it in at number 18. At number 17, I've got Sleepless in Peckham, which was released in 2003. It was the final Only Fools and Horses episode ever made. It did come under quite a bit of criticism. I think a lot of that probably came from the fact that it wasn't the ending that time on our hands was. You know, that was such a nice ending. And I'm one of those people that say perhaps they should have just left it there. You know, Del Boy, Rodney and Uncle Albert walking off into the sunset and living happily ever after. They ended it brilliantly. They almost didn't need to come back to it in a way. I know it was nice to see more episodes, but I don't know. There were, the ending for me, it just wasn't as satisfying as time on our hands had been. Don't get me wrong, it was still a nice ending. Good things did still happen. Uncle Albert came back from beyond the grave to help uh, the Trotters with their financial woes. We had Cassandra and Rodney finally having a little baby. We had an answer to that question I mentioned from Thicker Than Water around Rodney's dad and who that was and what happened around that. You know, there was a bit of closure there, particularly in that final conversation between Del Boy and Rodney in the graveyard. So it was a good ending and it felt, it was a feel good ending, but time and a hands felt better to me. <laughs> and so I almost think it should have been left there. There was also a few problems I think around the script related to this episode, particularly I think in relation to Trigger. There were some jokes in this episode that Trigger did around blinking and a back scratcher and they were just a bit, I don't, they were just a bit rubbish. They just weren't very funny, I didn't feel. Particularly when we look at how good the writing was for Trigger in Only Fools and Horses up to this point. And also there is absolutely no avoiding the fact that Damien is very, very annoying. I think we all know that. In at 16, I've got Diamonds Are For Heather. I did not realize this was a Christmas special, but apparently it is. Um, it's never it's never been a favorite of mine. It, it does reveal to us something about Del Boy though, which I think is quite important. It reveals to us that Del Boy is, you know, underneath all the brash sort of bravado that he presents. It reveals to us that Del Boy is a sensitive soul and he is looking to settle down. And of course that does come back up later in Only Fools and Horses, particularly in relation to the episode dates. But the episode as a whole for me, I felt it was slightly forgettable. Just my opinion. Some people really enjoy this one, but for me, not a favorite. In at 15, I have got a royal flush. A lot of people would probably put this one bottom of their list and I get that. I mean, I think there are bits in the episode that are really funny, particularly in relation to, you know, Del Boy goes for that shoot and he borrows Iggy again, shotgun, and you know, even the stuff at the start with the theatre, when he goes to the theatre with June. But for me, there, it's about that dinner scene at the end, isn't it? That's what we all remember from that episode. Del goes far too far in hanging Rodney out to dry, like he skewers him. All the way through Only Fools and Horses, every episode, you're rooting for Del Boy. You're thinking, 
you know, you, you want to love this character, but in this episode, and particularly in that dinner scene, he just goes too far, and rather than rooting for him, it just feels like we all just want him to shut up. You know, he goes way too far and really stitches Rodney up and isn't actually kind to Rodney. Apparently the episode also hit quite a few delays. The delays also impacted on the fact that the uh, episode didn't have a laughter track. So you probably watched it as I did prior to 2004 when they added a laughter track. There wasn't one there. It was, it didn't quite just, it just didn't feel like an Only Falls Nauses episode to me. At number 14, I've got If They Could See Us Now, which was released in 2001. It was the first of the most recent trilogy that were filmed of Only Fools and Horses. Like I say, released in 2001. I was 12 years old when this episode was released and I remember there being so much excitement and buzz that Only Fools and Horses was back. I'd never watched an episode of Only Fools and Horses live on the TV with the rest of the nation before because I'd been too young to watch them when they first came out. So there was a lot of excitement around this one. And the episode itself wasn't bad. When you think of the scene with Uncle Albert's funeral, you know, John Sullivan wrote that so well as he did with Grandad's funeral in earlier episodes, you know, there was humour there in what should have been a humourless situation. He really made it work. I also remember that scene with Trigger in the Trotter's flat where they put some music on and he's come over for a lift and all of that. I think that was hilarious, that whole scene. This one didn't feel the same as the, the pre-1996 episodes, you know, those Christmas specials that we had. It just didn't feel the same. Of course, Buster Merrifield was missing as Uncle Albert. Ken McDonald was also missing as Mike. So there was, you know, there were some key figures that were missing and I just feel there was was a, there was a gap there and there was a, they were missed. Those two particularly were really missed. And once again, I've brought up Damien already being quite annoying, but he was in this for the first time as like a sort of major character, if you like. And I feel like it changed the dynamic a little bit between the sort of four key characters and it didn't quite work for me with him there. I, I just, I'm not, I'm not a Damien fan, I gotta be honest. At number 13, I've got Christmas Crackers released in 1981. It was the first one ever made, but people still seem to love this one. It always ranks very highly. It's nostalgic, it reminds us of Christmases gone by, and it reminds us of Christmas Day now. You know, there's a lot in this episode that reflects what we do on Christmas Day, lounging around watching the same movies or the same TV specials every year, arguing about something, the Christmas dinner, all of that is in there, and it just, it feels wholesome because it reminds us of us, if you like. You know, it's not very long for a Christmas special, it's only 30 minutes long, uh, which is a little bit of a shame. Some, I, I quite like my Christmas specials to be a little bit longer. It's wholesome, it's nice, it's enjoyable, the, the major characters are in there, they're given really good screen time and that is why we love it. At number 12 I've got Strangers on the Shore released in 2002, the second to last Only Fools and Horses episode ever released and I felt this was the best of the new trilogy that they filmed personally. It's great to see the old gang back in Peckham doing what they do best, wheeling and dealing, you know Denzel's given a lot of time on screen, Boise, Trigger, the supporting cast are all there and they're all involved in the story which I always really enjoy and appreciate when they're involved and I love the way the whole story sort of came together with this one you know this this is how John Sullivan is genius because he'll take a joke that you think is insignificant in the whole grand scheme of things and he'll just make it work with the rest of the storyline what a writer and what a man only fools and horses would not exist without this guy but he wrote it so very well, and that is on show, I believe, in this episode. At number 11, I've got 1991's Miami Twice, a double-parted episode, very, very famous. I've seen it many, many times over the years. And as much as I enjoyed watching this one, I don't know, part of the charm of Only Fools and Horses for me is that ensemble cast, and they're not given a lot of screen time, particularly in part two of this episode. We barely see them. Of course, Boise and Marlene are there, but I wanted to see more of, you know, Mike and Trigo and Denzel and Cassandra and Raquel and Uncle Albert and all of these. But they're not really there and I think that's a bit of a shame. It leaves a bit of a hole in the episode for me. Part one is definitely the best of them. There's part one and part two. Part one is definitely the favourite. It feels a bit more like a normal Only Fools and Horses episode, which I enjoyed. On the whole, it is very funny. It's very enjoyable and it definitely is the reason that I still to this day have not been on a jet ski. Not taking the risk. At number 10, I've got 1992's Mother Nature's Son. I was always a big fan of this episode growing up. It felt, again, much like Strangers on the Shore did. It felt like the gang all together in Peckham, the ensemble cast is there. 
you know, they're just getting up to mischief and that, as I've said already, is where I feel Only Fools and Horses comes into its own when that ensemble cast is given a bit of space to shine and to be part of the main story. Yes, the special effects on the bottles that are glowing on the bedside table are a bit rubbish and look a bit dated now. But that sort of thing doesn't matter. You know, it's an enjoyable Only Fools and Horses romp. And for that reason, I commend it to you. And that is why it's in my top 10. This is at number 10. Have you seen the clip where Robbie Williams is in the background? I don't know. It does look like Robbie Williams in a wig. I'll pop the uh, screenshot of it up on screen for you now. I'll let you make your mind up on that one. But Mother Nature's Son, not bad. At number nine, I've got 1990's Rodney Come Home. It's a little bit more downbeat than most other Only Fools and Horses Christmas specials. It focuses a lot on the marital struggles that Rodney and Cassandra are going through at the time. However, I have ranked it so highly because there are some bits in there that are Only Fools and Horses gold. You know, that scene where Uncle Albert has to look shocked so that Rodney is taking Tanya from the Quick Fit exhaust centre out. You know, that scene, every now and again, it will just sort of go viral on online and everyone loves it and remembers how good Buster Merrifield was. Also, the reactions from David Jason as Del Boy, the whole scene is just hilarious. And for that reason, partly, I am ranking this episode so highly just for that one. Del Boy's heart comes through quite a lot in this storyline. You know, he wants to help. He wants to protect Rodney. He wants to try and help Rodney and Cassandra's marriage get back on track. And that comes through in this episode in the way that it didn't at all in A Royal Flush. At number eight, I've got To Hull and Back, released in 1985. It was the first feature length Only Fools and Horses episode. I actually re-watched this one earlier today on the TV because I hadn't seen it in years and I couldn't remember how much I enjoyed it. Turns out I really enjoyed it. It was a great episode. The ensemble cast don't feature very much, but we do have a big role for Boise, which is great because Boise, what a character. Perfect opportunity as well to say, John Chalice, what a man and what an actor. He added so much to this series and to this episode. But as a person, I met John once and I spoke to him a couple of times via Twitter as well, had some interactions with him on there. Always such a nice man, always very, very you know kind and had time for fans. So massive respect to John Chalice and into Hull and Back, his genius as Boise really, really does come through. It was also the second appearance in Only Fools and Horses of Jim Broadbent as Slater. And I actually think, even though we, we hate Slater, I think a lot of that is because of the way that Jim Broadbent plays him so well. He makes him so dislikable. As an episode to Hull and Back does seem to have its own identity. It feels very different uh, to any Only Fools and Horses before or after it. Bit like Miami Twice, I suppose, but I feel like To Hull and Back does it better than Miami Twice did. It really does work as like a, almost like a crime caper. And it also re somehow retains the heart of the show, which I think is really important. I will never be able to say the word Ajax without thinking of this episode now, and that's its legacy to me. At number seven, I've got 1987's The Frog's Legacy. Underrated, by the way, by a lot of people, including me. I rewatched it yesterday because again, I hadn't seen it in a number of years. And I really enjoyed it. It was a really good episode. It often gets forgotten, I feel, by fans, including myself. But the bit where Rodney leads the hearse up the one-way street, brilliant. Absolutely genius. As is the whole thing around the dinner plates that Del Boy and Boise have both gifted to Trigger's niece at her wedding. I just found that thing so funny. The main storyline going through this one is, you know, it's actually quite an emotional storyline. And it reminds us that Only Fools and Horses, at its heart, it's about family and it's about brotherhood and it's about all of those things, but also about making a few quid, you know? That's, that's all part of it. And I feel like The Frog's Legacy really captures all of those themes really well. At number six, I've got 1993's Fatal Extraction. This was the first ever Only Fools and Horses episode that I saw. There's some really good funny moments in there, you know, particularly when we think about Trigger popping in for just a couple of fillings, one voice singing in the darkness, all of that stuff. You know, there's some really memorable Only Fools moments in this episode. I didn't actually realize this was a play on Fatal Attraction, the movie, in recent years. That sort of twigged in my mind that it was a play on that one and a bit of a, a copy of the plot of that movie. Um, but for a long time, this was actually meant to be the final episode of Only Fools and Horses ever made. Although John Sullivan always had in his mind that he wanted to make the Trotter Brothers millionaires, by the time Only Fools and Horses came to an end. Which leads us nicely onto number five in my list, Heroes and Villains from 1996. I was actually tempted to put this one a little lower on my list than I have done. 
uh, because I feel like sometimes the, you know the famous shots of Dell and Rodney dressed up as Batman and Robin they're so well known and they're so commonly shown on on the internet or on TV they've almost become a little bit overused at times but you know it was funny, wasn't it? <laughs> so that's why it's ranked so highly. I feel like we see the best of Trigger in this episode, particularly that scene where he discusses his broom and it's 17 new heads and 14 new handles. Absolute genius. And most of this episode was also filmed in Bristol, uh, which is quite close to where I live here in Gloucester. And I have been to a lot of the locations from this episode in other videos. Again, if you haven't seen my videos where I tour the Only Fools and Horses locations, click on the link on screen right now or the link in the description. That will take you there for those. This episode was actually voted best Christmas special ever in a poll uh, not so long ago, I seem to remember. But personally, I feel like there are four episodes of Only Fools and Horses that are just that little bit better. At number four, I have got Dates, which was released in 1988. Now this is apparently John Sullivan's favorite ever Only Fools and Horses episode. And you can see why, there's a lot going on in here. We've got Derek Duval finally meeting Raquel, or is that Rachel, underneath the clock at Waterloo Station via the predecessor to Tinder, I suppose you would call it. And we've even got Rodney embracing his inner James Dean, much to the regret of Nervous Neris. On the whole, this is a very touching, well-grounded story. It lacks silliness, and it feels like it moves the series forward as well. Del Boy isn't trying to play around. He's not trying to hold Rodney back. He's trying to settle down. He's trying to grow up. His character, again, is redeemed even more from that sort of royal flush fiasco and image that created for him. It moves away from that and it makes Del Boy that caring person that we know that he is at heart. At number three, I've got Modern Men, which was also released in 1996. For me, this is a really underrated episode for a lot of reasons, which I'll now go on to explain. Now, firstly, it contains well, to me, two of the funniest Only Fools and Horses scenes and little sketches that happen. The uh, incident with the tray of drinks and the five pound note with Trigger, absolutely hilarious. That one always gets me. And even the bit later on in the episode with the Ivor Hardy phone call. <laughs> You've just sat here laughing about it now, thinking about it. The phone call between Dell and Rodney uh, from the, the rooms of the flat. That is just honestly one of my favourite bits ever. But where this episode comes into its own for me is, of course, that ending that it has. Now, the ending of this one is probably the most emotional that Only Fools and Horses gets at any point. Cassandra having a miscarriage shouldn't have any comedy attached to it. It shouldn't work in a comedy sitcom such as Only Fools and Horses. But John Sullivan, just like he did with Grandad's death, Uncle Albert's funeral, somehow handles that whole storyline and that whole subplot with absolute respect and sensitivity. But he also draws some comedy out of it too, which is the genius of the man. You know, nobody can write that scene as well as John Sullivan can, in my opinion. And in this, this ending, we also see what Del Boy is about as a character. Everything he does, everything he's about, it's for family, it's for Rodney, it's for those that he loves. And I don't think I love Del Boy ever more than I do in this scene, in this ending. At number two, I've got Time On Our Hands. 1996, it was supposed to be the ending. They say that perfect endings don't exist. But I beg to differ, Time on Our Hands was for me the perfect ending. You're always expecting it to go wrong, aren't you? In that moment where they get the money, you're expecting something bad to happen, but it doesn't. Dell and Rodney get the happy ending that we always hoped they would and that their hard work deserved and warranted. And it all happens so brilliantly and so emotionally. I just think they nailed the ending, you know, the elevator heart to heart never fails to give me a little tear, as does when they triumphantly enter into the nag's head at the end and Mike gives them the drinks on the house, you know, all of that stuff. It's just so emotional and so brilliantly done. The music is perfect, the script is funny, the ensemble cast, they play their role in the episode brilliantly as they always do. And I love the way that John Sullivan did it, you know, the very receipts that Rodney was seen sorting out in episode one are the very thing that makes them millionaires. All those episodes later, it was there the whole time. It just makes me wish they'd left it there. You know, it was too perfect. It was just right. And you know, because of that episode now, I always check the 
coffee in the gravy jars, just to be sure. Now that of course means number one, 1989's Jolly Boys outing. Yes, time on our hands was the perfect ending. Yes, episodes such as Heroes and Villains provided us with those iconic moments and those massive laughs. But the strength of Jolly Boys outing, my number one for me, is found in its ensemble cast. You've got Mickey Pierce, you've got Jevon, you've got Boise, Mike, Denzel, Trigger, Sid, Alan and Pamela Parry, Raquel, Cassandra, they're all in there and they all play their part and the laughs are there too. You know, the bus exploding, the Villa Bella, the great Ramondo, Trigger and his dolphin. And when everybody's talking, that song kicks in over that montage of everybody having fun. It just, I don't know, it just reminds us of our epic days out that we've had with our friends and it evokes that sort of nostalgia, or at least it did for me anyway, of all the, the fun times we've had in the past. And you know, that's the thing about these characters, I feel, that, that ensemble cast that I keep talking about. Everybody knows somebody who's like Boise or who's like Trigger or everybody's got an older member of their family who's like Uncle Albert. You know, we've all got these people in our lives and that for me is what makes this episode so special. It's a show that we can identify with and that's what makes this episode my number one. I love it. I've said a lot of words. Hopefully you've enjoyed them. Do let me know your order down below as well. I'd be really interested to know what your favourite Only Fools and Horses episode is. And let me know if I've got it wrong. Why not? Let's talk about it. Be nice, of course. Everyone's allowed to have their opinion. This is mine. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate you being here as always. If you're new, please do subscribe to the channel down below. And I'll see you soon for another video. Take care, everybody. Bonjour.